All right. Welcome to chapter five. Uh, we'll be now dealing with discrete and uh, continuous uh, distributions. So we have covered, uh, um, let me just uh, orient you on where we are now in terms of uh, the course. We've covered uh, chapter one, which was nothing but descriptive statistics and chapter two, was descriptive regression, chapter three was time series, chapter four was probability. Now we are basically saying, if we are dealing with a population, whereas we have um, talked about, uh, you know, uh, describing um, uh, descriptive statistics in chapter one, okay, descriptive, descriptive statistics, um, where we summarize some sample information, etc. We are basically saying now, when we are actually dealing with an exact population, or we are not dealing with an with a population, we can we can have what we call a population distribution. It could be known, um, 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 and if it's known, of course, through maybe repeated sampling and uh, and techniques such as that, we can actually. Uh, talk about some certain characteristics of these populations and there are some key distributions. Um, and when you talk about a distribution, think about it. It's just nothing but uh, something to do with the, with the description of the shape and uh, the characteristics um, of some given um, uh, phenomena. Um, uh, for, 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 for now, I'm just calling it phenomena, but we're going to introduce to you guys soon what we call a random variable. So, um, um, uh, but in this case, we can just say a particular variable. All right. So we're saying uh, uh, we can actually construct the distribution of the population. All right. And this distribution of the population, you will see now that it could be discrete, it could be continuous, depending on the nature of the of the variable. All right. That's what we're getting to. So. So some experiments um, um, occur often, and the probability distributions of uh, associated with these experiments have been expressed in general form. All right, so there's been some form of generalization of uh, certain experiments which occur often. You know, like things like rolling um, some dice and things like that, and things like that. You know, counting the number of people coming into some meeting somewhere, you know, or passing through some traffic light and things like that, or the amount of time it takes for something to happen, etc. you know. So we have uh, about four distributions that we're going to characterize in this course. And uh, the first one is what we call the binomial distribution and we have the Poisson distribution. These two are discrete. And we will talk about the exponential distribution. We'll talk about the normal distribution. All right. Um, and these two are continuous distributions. Okay. So the objectives of this chapter include understand, of course, understanding is very important, what probability distribution is and the properties it possesses. All right. Identify and distinguish between discrete and continuous distribution. Identify special case or special discrete and continuous uh, probability distribution. Calculate probabilities and population parameters from probability distributions. All right, good. And of course, there'll be some formula. It should be there at the um, end of lecture notes. And um, you can see the same formula. In fact, in your uh, versions of the notes, um, um, the, the booklet, should have the formula right here. Okay, so there's quite a number of formula, I suppose. Then, um, all right, let's introduce what a random variable is. So a random variable is a function that assumes a value as a result of an experiment. All right. So what are we saying here? We're basically saying that you have an experiment. Uh, think about an experiment such as maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, tossing a coin. You toss a coin and um, you can either, it can either land on the head or land on the tail, all right? But you could now say, 
uh, you want to toss this coin 10 times, for example. If you toss a coin 10 times, and now the question could be, um, how, many, how many heads do you have? You know? So it's, it's now assuming some value um, uh, um, as a result of this tossing of a coin. What are we basically saying? We're saying the number of heads is a number. Okay, it's a, it's, it's a value, it's a value, all right? Uh, resulting from an experiment. And that could be seen as X, okay? We could say X is equal to the number of heads observed. Observed, you know, from uh, tossing a coin, something like that. So, of course, this is going to assume some value, going to be some value. It could be zero, it could be one, it could be two, it could be three, etc. Okay? Of course, if you have 10 tosses, it could actually be 10 as well. That's the kind of thing I'm doing. So a function, the function relates a unique, the function we're talking about here, relates a unique um, uh, value your numerical value to the to every outcome of the experiment all right as 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 the outcome of the of the execution of the experiment is not known in advance this is where the randomness comes in okay it it will vary from trial to trial all right and trial are basically meaning a toss in this case one toss second toss third toss etc all right the two um there are two types of random variables, and we have discrete and continuous. So what do we mean by that? Discrete variable, discrete random variable, a discrete random variable is a numerical variable that can take on discrete values. Okay, it can take on discrete values. Think about things like one, two, three, etc. To be technical, actually, we will still have 1.1. .1 um, let me use that here, 1.2, uh, 1.3. This is also discrete, all right? This is also discrete, okay? So you can see the idea here is we're jumping. We're jumping from one value to another value. But for a continuous variable, we're dealing with um, uh, things such as um, things such as this, we're saying x is between zero and one, for example. So if you think about something like this, you can see here that x can be 0 0.0000000001. x can be, you know, 0 0.1110000001, things like this. So this is a continuous um, kind of scale here or interval. All right, it's a continuous interval we're dealing with over there. So, uh, in the random variable, we, uh, a continuous random variable would be assuming uh, intervals such as such as uh, 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 those. All right. So the question here says, determine whether the following random variables are discrete or continuous. So um, we have a description, and of course, we must tell what type um, the random variable is whether it's discrete or continuous. The number of heads in three tosses of a coin, clearly that's discrete, all right? Clearly that's discrete. But the number of heads in three tosses of a coin, that number of heads can be, um, the number of heads, think about it, it can be uh, zero, it can be one, it can be two, it can be three. I mean, it can't, it's not a continuous variable. It can be 0 0.05, for example. Uh, we're dealing with a number of heads. All right. Now, the time taken to toss a coin three times, you're dealing now with the time. So the time taken it is actually a continuous variable. All right. It can be zero. It can be one minute. It can be uh, 0 0.1 minute, minutes. It can be 0 0.5 minutes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a continuous um, it can be 0 0.000005. It's, it takes on um, any value uh, that you can think about. All right. So it's not based on uh, jumps, discrete jumps between um, the times. All right. 
The number of children in a household, you can also see that this is discrete, all right? So it could be zero, no children in the house, one, two, etc. Then the height of a randomly selected person, this can be seen as a continuous variable, all right? Then the value of money uh, carried by a randomly chosen person, of course, money in the broadest sense could also include electronic uh, money, etc. And you can see this is continuous. All right. Any random variable has a probability distribution in a population context, which is a collection of all possible values, okay, all possible values of the variable and the corresponding probabilities of occurrence. Such probabilities are essentially the weights assigned to a particular outcome of the variable. What are we saying? We're saying, if you think about what we did in chapter one, you were told about things to do with uh, relative frequency, for example. So relative frequency was a measure of proportion of um, uh, the, you know, the percentage or the percentage frequency associated with a certain number or certain class and things like that. Numbers, uh, of course, when you're dealing with discrete, um, um, when you're dealing with discrete um, variables, but when you're dealing with continuous, you'll be dealing with an, a class or something or an interval. But that idea of a, of a relative frequency is actually coming through here again, if you think about it. We are now talking about probabilities. But we're saying, of course, the probability is a measure of proportion, okay? Proportion or some kind of weight. This is how we are bringing this idea of weight, okay? So we are saying, um, if, you, if you're dealing with the uh, uh, population distribution, essentially, uh, you have a collection of all possible values. That's whatever variable can, can assume and you'll be dealing as well with the probabilities of occurrence for all these values, all right? And they're saying higher probabilities or higher weights, okay, means that that event or that uh, event in that class, if it's a continuous case, is uh, more likely to occur, okay? Heavy events, that's what you mean by heavy events. It's things that are more likely to happen, all right? For a discrete random variable x, the probability distribution of x is referred to the probability mass function, all right? So we're saying for discrete variables, we have what you call the probability mass function, all right? The PMF for discrete random variables, all right? And for, um, for a continuous random variable, the probability distribution is referred to as the probability density, density function. So you can see that the mass has to do with the discrete variable and the density um, function has to do with the um, continuous variable. All right. So you can just about think, of, you can just about think, you can think about where we're getting to. Remember we said we're going to deal with a binomial distribution, which is a discrete. So we have um, uh, binomial distributions and we have the Poisson distribution and we have the exponential density, exponential. Uh, so in terms of PMFs, et cetera. Then um, we have the normal uh, distribution, all right. But before we even get to these classical distributions, we will talk about um, uh, the PMF in a very general sense, and we'll do the same for the probability density function, the PDF. All right. With sample data, we can calculate various measures of central tendency and variability. All right, with sample data, various measures of central tendency and variability producing sample statistics. The probability distribution for any random variable represents a population of interest. All right. We're also able to calculate the population parameters from these distributions, all right? So that's the idea. So in as much as we could, that's basically what we are saying over here. 
in as much as we could calculate um, uh, sample statistics from uh, sample data, you know, um, um, we're saying when we have a distribution, when we have a probability distribution, which is a population distribution actually, we can now also calculate population parameters from these population distributions. All right. This is basically what we're getting to. Because we have population, uh, if we have a population distribution, we should be able to calculate uh, population parameters from that distribution. So we can calculate uh, parameters such as um, the mean, the mean, which is nothing but what we are going to call the expectation. So you would expect to get the mean on average, all right? So, um, and the expectation is what we call, uh, or it indicates rather the center of the distribution. So where the center is, if you have distribution, where the center is, that's where your uh, expectation is, which is nothing but the, the mean of the distribution, all right? Then we also talk about, um, uh, okay, we would denote that rather by EX, like I just put that now, it's expected value of X. We're saying X is our random variable, all right? And um, uh, yeah, expected value of X or the mean or the average value of X is also called that. Then the population variance, sigma, we call that sigma squared. Remember, this is now um, uh, the variance in the uh, population sense, all right? So it's sigma squared, it's not S squared, all right? S squared, it will be the sample. I'm sure you remember that from chapter one. The population standard deviation will be sigma, all right? So, um, so these are measures that you can use to describe the spread. Think about it. We talked about this in chapter one, I think. The idea of spread or dissipation. All right, how spread the values are around the mean. That's the point, all right. Numerous other population parameters can be obtained from probability distributions, all right? We can actually obtain also things like the mode, like we did in chapter one, but now in the population sense, not in the sample space, not in the sample sense, but in the population sense, all right? And things like the median as well. But um, most of these, like the mode, et cetera, we might not, um, cover that too much, but um, yeah, we will we'll see how it goes. All right. And of course, percentiles and interquartile range, etc. All right. So discrete random variables. All right. What is the probability mass function? We're saying the probability mass function is a set of all possible outcomes. In this uh, case, we're dealing with a value X and their corresponding probabilities for a discrete random variable, all right? All possible outcomes. So we're dealing with a small letter X denotes the possible outcomes and the capital X denotes the random variable, all right? The random variable here is denoted by, uh, by capital X and the small X is denoting some possible outcomes, all right? And we're saying, uh, the probability mass function is actually the set that contains all the possible uh, outcomes and their corresponding probabilities, all right? Think about it this one. We're saying it will be something like this, where you're saying this is your value of x, okay? Uh, the random variable is assuming some um, uh, possible outcomes, which are denoting by small letter x. In this case, it could be 0, 1, and two, and then you assign probabilities to this, okay? It could be one over three, one over three, one over three. You could see that I chose this value specifically for some reason that I'm going to talk about right now. All right. So there are two definitive uh, pro properties that have to be satisfied uh, uh, with probability mass functions. All right. So each probability must be between zero and one inclusive, all right? So you can see exactly what I was trying to get to when I was doing this table over here, all right? You can see that the, this, every probability here is uh, between zero and one. 
In other words, this one over three here is between zero and one, zero and one, zero and one, all right. And of course, we're also saying the sum of the probabilities, the sum of the probabilities should be equal to one. And of course, if we sum one over three here, one plus one over three plus one over three, if we sum all these probabilities, you see that um, we're going to get one, all right? Um, and both of these properties must hold for a function to be classified as a PMF or a probability mass function. So this is an example. This is a typical example um, of a probability mass function. All right, probability mass function. So basically what we're trying to get to is that we must list all the possible outcomes. And for each and every possible outcome of that variable, we must list the probability associated with that variable, with that outcome. And two conditions must be satisfied. The probability must always be between zero and one, all right? And the second um, um, uh, uh, property is that the sum of all the probabilities must be equal to one. All right, good. Let's move. And we talk about the expected value and the variance. Okay, we're going to have some formula to that. Expected value, like we said, is the mean, all right? So this is what we, are, what we can see over here. Expected value is the mean. We know that mu is the mean, all right? Mu is the mean, okay? You guys, you should kind of remember that we say it in chapter one, X bar is a sample mean, whereas mu is a population mean. So the mean we're talking about here is actually the population mean, because we're dealing with the population distribution, all right? In this case, it's a population mass, uh, uh, rather, population, um, a probability, rather, probability mass function, um, because we're dealing with a discrete variable, okay? But we're saying, if we sum all the x values multiplied by the respective probabilities, if we sum all the x values multiplied by the respective probabilities, we should get the expected value of x, okay? That's the formula for the expected value of x. There's a bit of theory behind this, but if you think about it, um, you can actually see this as well from, from the classical definition of probability, the priori definition of probability. Or when you're talking about um, so a number of elements satisfying a given criteria over to the number of elements in the sample space and things like that. If you think about it from that sense, you can see where this formula is coming from, all right? So although the derivation of the formula is not part of this course, I'll leave that. Um, we don't have to bother much about that. But the intu intuition behind this formula is that you multiply, if we go back to the given example here, the idea here is if you want to find expected value of X, for example, here, we would come and say um, uh, zero times one over three plus one times one over three plus two times one over three. This is the kind of thing we're going to do, all right? So we take every, we take every value, all right? We multiply it by its probability, and we add to the next value multiplied by its probability. We add as well to the next value multiplied by its probability. And if we do all values, we're going to get the population mean, which is the expected value of X. This is basically what we're doing over here. All right, enough of that. Then the variance is nothing but sigma squared. Whereas, of course, for the sample, we're dealing with S squared. Here, we're dealing with sigma squared for the population, all right? And we're basically saying that we will be having this formula. Um, this is uh, the background behind the formula. You can uh, kind of look at what is happening there. But what is important for us is this part. All right, so it will be the expected, uh, it will be the, the sum of x squared multiplied by the probabilities of x minus the mean squared. Because this whole thing here is the mean, okay? We just saw it from here. So essentially, we are saying, if we use that example that I just gave of x with, um, um, 0, 1, 2, and probability of x being um, 
let me put probability of x over here probability of x being 1 over 3 1 over 3 1 over 3 if we should use this example quickly to illustrate something we are saying you need to put an x squared here which is in this case 0 squared which is 0 1 squared is 1 2 squared is 4 okay and based on this we can calculate this quantity here so this quantity here is going to be the sum of x squared times the probability of x so we're now dealing with 0 times 1 over 3 plus and the zero i'm dealing with here is not this one here. we're dealing we're not dealing with this zero we're dealing with this one here all right and of course the probability still is one over three then we add to that we add one times one over three and the one i'm dealing with is not this one here but this one here. all right and the probability is that then we also add to four times one over three and i'm saying from this we should subtract the mean um or the, 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 in fact, we had calculated it uh, over there. You should have seen that if we calculate everything here, we'd get um, um, 0 plus 1 over 3 plus um, 2 over 3, which is going to be equal to 1. So the mean is 1. So in this case, we would say minus 1 squared. And then we should be able to get to the answer, which in this case would yield um, to zero plus one over three plus four over three minus one and this would give us um five over three minus one which is equal to two over three okay something like that so this is essentially um how we would calculate the expected value and how we calculate the variance okay so i'm saying this is sigma squared whereas this is the expected value or mu, all right? But of course, you, if you want to, you can call this the variance of x as well. All right, all right, let's move. Exercise 5.2, consider an experiment where a fair coin is tossed three times. Uh, the sample space of this experiment can be completely determined because of this particular experimental design, all right? So we're basically saying here that we, we have this experiment where um, we are tossing a fair coin three times. And uh, we record um, um, whether it lands on the head or on the tail. In this case, we're saying the sample space or the set of possible outcomes can be denoted by this S here. What's happening here? We're saying we can observe three tails, which is what is happening here. Okay, three tails or two tails. First, uh, first uh, toss um, um, being a tail, the second toss being a tail again, and the third toss being a head. Okay, and we move like that. Tail, head, tail, all right? Head, tail, tail. So in total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible outcomes. Okay, if you think about it, we have two possible outcomes on the first toss. We have two possible outcomes on the second toss, and we have two possible outcomes on the third toss. And in total, we then have eight possible um, outcomes. Okay, you can uh, kind of refresh on counting rules using this little example as well. But what is important to us here is actually to get into the idea of probability mass function. So let the random variable x denote the number of tails, okay? So in particular here, we want to look at the number of tails in the three tosses of the coin, which you can see here that the number of tosses here, the number of tails rather, sorry, is three. Number of tails here is two. Number of tails here is two again. Two, one, 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 zero. So we can see, that the number of tails takes on these values here. It can be a zero, it can be one, it can be two, it can be three. All right. So we can actually start talking about um, X, of course, um, assuming these three values, or four values rather, zero included, zero, one, two, three. Um, and these are the examples from the 
from the from the sample space. I'm sure you, sh you should be able to follow this. Okay, so we have we have one observation where x is equal to zero. We have three observations where x is equal to one or possible outcomes rather. Let me put it that way. We have three possible outcomes where x is equal to two and we have one possible outcome where x is equal to three. So we can now construct a PMF, probability mass function, for the number of tails in the three tosses of a fair coin. All right, we can now produce a PMF. All right, so we need to also make sure that the properties of the PMF are satisfied. And remember the properties of the PMF is that, um, the one property is that all the probabilities must be between um, zero and one inclusive. And second one is that sum of the probabilities must be, the sum of the probabilities must be equal to one. All right. So um, here is our PMF. So we're saying we have eight possible outcomes, okay? We have eight possible outcomes. Think about it. We have eight possible outcomes. And we're saying where X is equal to zero, we only have one possible outcome. So the probability associated with X is equal to zero is going to be one divided by eight, all right? Because we have one outcome, one possible outcome for X is equal to zero, and we have eight outcomes in total. And if you think about the definition of probability given in chapter four, a classical definition of probability, you will find that the probability associated with X is equal to zero is going to be one over eight. All right, good. And the probability associated with X is equal to one is going to be equal to three divided by eight. And for X is equal to two is also going to be three divided by eight. And for X is equal to three, we're also going, we're now going to get one divided by eight. That kind of thing, that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. So we see where to get these probabilities. And of course, we're saying all of these probabilities are between zero and one inclusive, and that is desirable, that is very good. And the second property is that the sum of the uh, probabilities must be equal to one. If we sum all these probabilities, one over eight plus three over eight, plus three over eight, plus one over eight. Indeed, we get one, four, seven, eight, which means we would have an eight over eight, which is equal to one, all right? Which is this one here. So we can see that indeed, this is a probability mass function. All right, now we can answer a few questions. The first question says, use the PMF to calculate the probability, the following probabilities and parameters. Okay, the probability uh, to begin with, we're asked to calculate the probability um, that we have no tails. So probability that there's no tails is actually probability. You remember no tails means we have all heads. And all heads in this case means our X, remember X is the number of tails observed, which means that in this case, X is supposed to be equal to zero. So the probability of no tails is the probability that X is equal to zero. And the probability that x is equal to zero, we can see it clearly from here, and that is equal to one over eight. All right, then we go to number two, which says the probability um, of at least two tails. At least two tails means we can have uh, two tails, or we can have three tails. Okay, oh, yeah, so. That's the kind of thing we're dealing with. So probability of at least two tails can be seen as probability that X is greater than or equal to two, all right? If we had said more than two tails, it should have been reading probability that X is greater than two. But we were saying at least, we also include the two. So this can be X is equal to two or X is equal to three. And because these two are mutually exclusive, we add the probabilities, okay? We add the probabilities. There's nothing common. So we use basically using the addition rule, okay? And there's nothing common, so there's nothing to subtract. There's nothing to subtract. Okay. We cannot have two tails 
and three tails at the same time in the same occurrence. It's not possible. It's not possible. All right. So probability that x is equal to two, we can clearly see it from here. Probability that x is equal to three, we can also see it from there. And if we sum these two probabilities, we get four over eight, which is nothing but 0 0.5. All right, good. Looks like we're moving in a good um, uh, direction there. So probability that we have at most, at most three tells. What does at most three tells mean? It means that um, less than or equal to three. X must be less than or equal to three. The number of tells must not exceed three. And of course, you can see that this is a sure event. Why are we saying that? Because the number of tells cannot exceed three. I mean, the possible outcomes of X there, they're all less than or equal to three. But of course, you could see it that way and you could still see uh, it from the fact that X is less than or equal to three is, is equal to probability that X is equal to zero plus probability that X is equal to one plus probability that X is equal to two plus probability that X is equal to three. And of course, uh, it would be one over eight plus three over, it would be um, one over eight plus three over eight plus three over eight plus one over eight. And this will give you eight over eight, which is also equal to one. All right. So this is a sure event. All right. Then we go to uh, number five, number four, sorry, which says probability of one or two terms. Probability of one or two terms. What does it mean, one or two terms? So x can be equal to one or x can be equal to two. Okay, and we can add these two probabilities because these are mutually exclusive events. Okay, so x is equal to one, three over eight. Okay, and x is equal to two, is also three over eight over here. So if we add these two, we get six over eight, and uh, six over eight can be seen as zero point seven five. All right, let's move to number five. Now we want to calculate the expected value. So the expected value is nothing but the population mean, all right? And we know the formula for that is summation of X multiplied by probability of X. Summation of X multiplied by probability of X. And in this case, we're saying the X values are going from zero to one to two to three. And the probabilities are this, one over eight, three over eight, three over eight, and three over eight. And you must find the products and these products must be added. Okay, we add the products. And then of course, zero times one over eight gives us zero. Okay? One times three over eight gives us three over eight. Two times three over eight gives us six over eight. And three times uh, one over eight gives us three over eight. And if you sum everything here, you get 12 over eight, which is nothing but 1.5. And we're saying that is the population mean. All right, this should be a bit clear. Should not be very complicated. Number six says, uh, or oh, is asking us to calculate the variance. So how do we calculate the variance? We calculate the variance using the given formula. So summation of x squared times px, okay? Summation of x squared times px minus the population mean, all right? We've already seen this formula before. But the point is we need to use the squared values of x. This is very important. We need to use the squared values of x when you're calculating the, the variance. Of course, then we subtract the square of the of the mean over there. So this zero here is a value of X. We're saying we must square it. This one here is a value of X. We must square it. The two must also be squared. The three must also be squared, all right? And the probabilities come straight like that, okay? We don't square the probabilities. Then of course, we must subtract the square of the mean and the mean was 1.5 according to number five, okay? The mean was 1.5. So we should subtract the square of the mean. And of course, zero squared times one over eight gives you a zero. 
one times, one squared times three over eight gives you three over eight. And you go like that, 12 over eight, nine over eight, and you subtract 1.5 squared. And this gives us 24 over eight minus 1.5 squared. And you get that. And the final answer will be 0 0.75. All right. So this is basically um, what we're talking about. I think I should stop right here and uh, make a separate video for um, the next um, two examples, okay? For the next um, four examples, rather. There's about four examples that I'm going to make a separate video on. All right. Then we, after that, we move to the binomial distribution. Good.